everybody. Welcome to Sweater Weather, a podcast about Canadian arts and culture. I'm Aaron Giovanone, a writer and professor. And I'm Naomi Lewis, a writer and an editor. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. And yourself? I'm good. Mm -hmm. I'm good. It's uh, Christmas time. Yeah. It's the holiday season. It's the most wonderful time of the year. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm wearing my, this is actually a shirt that I wear only during the holidays. That's right. Because it's, shirt. it's kind of obnoxious to wear red and green of this sort. I think, it I think you could wear it any time. But. <laughs> okay. <laughs> also lit the studio with red and green as well. That was oh, yeah. uh, the color choices. Nicely done. Yeah. So. I knew I felt festive, but I couldn't put my finger on why. <laughs> <laughs> How's the holiday season going for you so far? Well, it's uh, a lot of socializing, which mm. is kind of a shock to the system, but a good one. It's nice. Mm -hmm. It's nice to finally see people again. It is. To go out and do stuff. It is, it people is. having parties. Lots of dinners and lunches. Dinners. Yeah. Yeah. I'm enjoying it. Mm -hmm. Me too. Um, so we want to let everyone out there know if you like sweater weather, it'd be really nice if you support us with... Uh, well, there's a lot of ways you can support us on social media, wherever you see us, a like or a share. A review. A review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Mm -hmm. um, that all really helps uh, people, other people see us and hear us. So Find us. If you really like us, we'd appreciate your support at patreon.com forward slash Canadian sweater. And you can make a monthly donation there. And patrons of the show currently get some perks. They get uh, early access to new episodes. They mm -hmm. get them before everybody else. And there's a few other things there. We are going to be in the new year. It's maybe one of our New Year's resolutions is to start building our Patreon community. That's right. That's right. And offering special, special patron only episodes. Mm -hmm. Now, this is, I guess, a little bit of a tease for what will be coming in the new year at some point that's right that's right but the new year being 2023 20, oh that's right who knows when people are watching this. i know it could be like 10 years from now that's right <laughs> <laughs> i hope i hope we yeah. really last that long mm -hmm. in public consciousness we will Aaron. we will <laughs> <laughs> especially this episode yeah yes i mean the holiday ho this is a holiday episode and like the holiday episodes are the ones that people watch again and again that's right like last night we watched what did we watch? A Muppet Family Christmas <laughs> from 1987. Yeah, that's right. There's a good version on YouTube. <laughs> and it hasn't gotten old at all. But we're not making this podcast about the Muppet this is Family not, Christmas. This is not a Muppets Family Christmas podcast. No. This is, well, I'm not going to introduce the topic of our show quite yet. Not before we introduce our guest. Our guest today is Maxime Raymond Bach. So Maxime has published five books of fiction in French, his latest being the novel Morel which appeared in 2021. Two of his books have been translated into English. These are Atavisms from 2015 and Baloney from 2016. So Max uh, has a PhD and is currently a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Alberta. And he's joining us from Montreal where he lives. Hi, Max. Hey guys, how are you? Good, good. Thanks for being here with us. Well, thanks for the invitation. You and Naomi did meet, right? I never met. I didn't meet you in person when we were in Montreal, but you and Naomi hung out. Yeah, we met we at the did. library. We, yeah, at the library, we uh, we had coffee and talked about uh, your visit to the doctor. That's right. Unfortunately, I <laughs> <laughs> Max's partner Melissa Bull is my friend, and she was the person who I was with when I injured my finger in Montreal. I was out for a drink with her when. The bathroom door of a bar slammed on my hand, and Melissa, who I met for the first time that day <laughs> in, in person, <laughs> took me to the hospital, yeah. talked to the doctors in French for me. That's nice. Yeah, it was amazing. And then we had to be friends because we were trauma bonded. <laughs> yeah. Well, you will remember your visit to Montreal forever. Yeah, whenever, I will. <laughs> whenever you see your little injury on your finger, you will remember Montreal. Yeah, it's true, but it was worth it to become friends with Melissa. It's, Although maybe yeah, I could have been sure. friends with her without that happening. Uh, sounds like the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Indeed, it was. Yeah, yes. bond, uh, a bond forged in fire. That's right. That's right. In blood. Yeah. <laughs> in blood. Fire and blood. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so today, so excited to have Maxim here with us to talk about our topic, 
our topic is. Naomi, you ready for this? Mm -hmm. It's the sweater. The sweater. The so, sweater weather? No. no. Just the sweater. <laughs> Don't muddy the waters here. I always thought it was called the hockey sweater. Yeah, so the animated film version of the mm -hmm. story is called the sweater. Mm -hmm. And the story version, book form, is called the hockey sweater. Okay. So we'll probably use those two interchangeably. And actually, the hockey sweater seems like a better title to me. And what what's the title in French in the original? Well, that's going to come. The original. Yeah. From 1979. Yeah. Mm -hmm. was not... Le chandail. It mm. was l'abominable feuille d'érable sur la glace. Oh. The abominable maple leaf on the ice. Okay. So this is a very mean? interesting transformation that Absolutely. happened between the two versions with the translation. That's something we could talk about because that's, that's really interesting comparing yeah, the two versions. Absolutely. Yeah. So I probably will call it the hockey sweater, although... We are talking about the film probably a lot, and that's called The Sweater. So, All right. So The Sweater is from 1980. It's an animated short film written and narrated by Rock Carrier, and it's based on his 1978. I mean, it was published in 79, but it was performed, I think, for the first time in 78, called The Hockey Sweater. So, In English. In English, mm -hmm. yeah. So it has had different versions over the, over the years. In French, currently... What is the story called? Is it it's called Le Chandail in French? Le Chandail. Le Chandail. Yeah. Okay. So the same as the film in French. Okay. Apparently. Right. Okay. But there okay. are subtitles. Uh, the second title in French is different from the the English subtitle. Second title also in the the movie. That's really interesting. Oh, okay. They skip the abominable again in the movie. Okay. Because the, the the French title is Le Chandail, un abominable souvenir. Oh, ah. de Carrier, an abominable uh, reminiscence. Yeah. Oh, and wow. in, in the yeah. English, it's just a childhood recollection. That's right. That's really interesting how it they is, they is. toned it down. Yeah. For the yeah. for the English audience. <laughs> for the yeah 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 yeah, yeah those really interesting. Who might have other um, loyalties, but we'll get to that. <laughs> yeah, I mean this. They were very careful to make sure the story appealed to like the two solitudes, mm -hmm. uh, and they had so slightly different versions for both. Yeah. It is interesting. So the sweater film is animated by Sheldon Cohen, a, M a Montreal animator, uh, director, graphic artist. Now, the sweater tells the story of a young a rock carrier who, at 10 years old, lives in his small village of St. Justine. And he's a diehard fan of the great Maurice Richard, star player for his adored Montreal Canadiens. The uh, Rocket, right? Was the, the, rocket, the Rocket. The Rocket. The Rocket. So the, fil the film and story is set in 1946, the year before Maurice Richard had, had broken, had scored 50 goals in a season, which was the first time any player had done that. Oh. So, however, so after a mix-up, ordering from the Eaton's catalog, Carrier is forced to wear the jersey of the hated rival team, the Maple Leafs. The abominable Maple Leafs. That's right. And so, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so the story, the story ensues from there. Mm -hmm. So you're going to say something, Max. I think I cut you off. No, I was just reacting to uh, the abominable Maple Leafs. This yeah. Is yeah. Funny. <laughs> the Leafs suck. Even their fans will say that the Leafs suck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the hockey, the hockey sweater uh, was published as a standalone children's book with Sheldon Cohen's illustrations as well. That book has gone on to sell over three hundred thousand copies in English and French. Just uh, yeah, I'm not sure, but okay. actually, yeah, yeah, good question. Actually, I'm not sure about that. Um, if you look at the film on YouTube, I mean, the English version has like over a million views, but that's just on YouTube. It mm -hmm. has many more millions of views than that, for yeah, sure. Yeah, a million and, sounds small. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, that's just a little bit of background on uh, the sweater or the hockey sweater. Do we have opening thoughts about the hockey sweater uh, or Rock Carrier? Uh, for like you know, original. I don't know. Did you were you familiar with this at all before, Naomi? I was familiar with it like vaguely. I feel like I must have read it or seen the film at some point in school, especially in French immersion. I went to French immersion as a kid in Ottawa. Yeah. And I mean, I couldn't remember it, but then when I saw it and read it again recently for the podcast, I remember. I knew the story, so 
obviously it was already in my head. And like, I knew that for some reason that was the only, like Maurice Richard was the only hockey player I'd ever heard of in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm pretty sure it's because of that book. <laughs> because of that book. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Max, how about you? What are your like first earliest memories of this story or of this author? Well, I think that when you have just a little bit of cultural and historical knowledge or understanding, you know about that story. It's uh, mm -hmm. it's 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 part of the culture, and I think I remember seeing the movie when I was younger, probably during Christmas time on TV, uh, and it's, it's just something that you know about, and you know I've. I've Noticed it was on the five dollar bills. That's of right. Of course. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's an excerpt of the story, and uh, but reading it for the first time, word for word, for our podcast, for our discussion, that was really interesting because, mm. you know, when stories like that are a part of the culture and you know about them without even having read them. Uh, yeah. Or having you to don't see the it. whole picture. You don't see all, all the details. And reading reading it and comparing the two versions in French and English and seeing both versions of the of the the animated film, that was really an interesting. Uh, uh, how can I say it? We're you know we're we're academics. We're writers. We we criticize every little detail. We find we interpret everything and try to see things with a, a wider stance and a wider uh, understanding of things. And it's there's really much more to this little story there. Uh, it's really interesting. And it, and it made me read again another novel from uh, Roque Carrier, La Guerre et Sir. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you heard about that no. one. This is really a really uh, heavier book than <laughs> yes. just a little children's story. But it deals with the same antagonisms and there's a mm. hockey scene in that book too which is very different and very violent so it's really interesting everything that's going on uh with rock carrier's uh, yeah translated in english uh by uh sheila fishman i think that's right yeah for anc in the 90s so you can look it up in english too a very different tone violence mm. it is draft dodgers Mm. I, I read, I uh, dipped into that book in preparation for today as well. It's a book for, I believe it's from, it was published in 1972. So it's six, six, oh, 68. 68. So it's earlier yeah. than, mm. than the hockey sweater. Mm -hmm. And it's not for children. It is definitely not for children. Okay. It opens with a scene, it no. opens with a scene, if I remember correctly, of a man cutting his hand off so that he doesn't have to be dra yeah. drafted oh. to go to the war. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So it's, it's a, a very and just just after that, kids are playing hockey with the severed hand. Oh, that's that's right. <laughs> they don't oh have my a gosh, yes. they don't have a hockey puck. They play with the severed hand. Oh my it's, goodness! Yikes. <laughs> it so is, that yeah. wouldn't for go <laughs> on the five dollar. That's for that's for the twenty dollar bill. That's right. That's for like the five hundred dollar bill. Only yeah. rich people can handle it. <laughs> Interesting change in tone from. <laughs> <laughs> Carrier's uh, writing yes. over the years, yeah, um, yeah. Maybe we'll have more. Maybe we'll have more of a chance to dip into the, some of the themes, the shared themes between the hockey sweater and La Guerre. Uh, yes, sir. Now, I uh, when when we were thinking of doing a, an episode for December for the holidays, uh, I did think of this story immediately, and I have really associated it with Christmas time. Mm -hmm. uh, I, of course, the gift of the hockey sweater. I think I misremembered it as being a Christmas gift. So did I, yeah. Yeah, so that's how much I associate it with Christmas mm -hmm. time. Now, I think another reason I associate it with Christmas time is because in elementary school, probably from grades like three to grade eight, St. Anne's Catholic School in Fenwick, Ontario, little, little village in the Niagara region of Ontario, they showed us this film like every year mm. in school, probably the last day before the Christmas break, mm -hmm. when the teachers don't want to teach anything and the students <laughs> don't want to learn anything and they wheel out the television. <laughs> and so they would show us kid-friendly films. And mm -hmm. this would always be on the playlist for that last day of school before mm -hmm. Christmas. And so uh, I think probably a teacher had questions for us after trying to make it a an appropriate school lesson of some sort. I don't remember what questions we were being asked. I wish I did. Mm -hmm. I wish I actually did remember what questions this, the teacher was asking us yeah. about this film. Now, I had, I mean, I had no connection at all to like hockey. 
My father is an Italian immigrant, did not play hockey, did not care about hockey. My mom's family, not athletic, not sports fans. So like there was no hockey in our house, no hockey culture really at all. Uh, I would watch Hockey Night in Canada, Saturday nights, kind of mm -hmm. like, uh, I guess, the way that little Rock Carrier listens to it on the radio in the story. But uh, we, it's because we only had like, uh, we only had five or eight television stations. Mm -hmm. So I was watching hockey because it was one of the only good things on. I wasn't a huge fan of hockey. I mean, I couldn't skate. Okay. Um, I didn't own proper skates. Um, actually, many people in our school, they were like, a lot of them, they were like immigrant, kids of immigrants, you know, like Greeks and Poles. Like they didn't play hockey either. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> I remember when our school would take us on like a, a, a yearly, maybe twice a year trip to the arena for a, an afternoon oh, yeah. skating. Like I hated that. Me too. Because <laughs> I had these, my, my mom like um, got me, be again, because it was like zero investment in skating or hockey, my mom got me some used skates that were like really, they were like leather from the 1970s. <laughs> Could not lace them properly. Oh, they were no. super floppy on my ankles, toes freezing. I found this annoying because I otherwise enjoyed <laughs> sports. Like I was like, uh, we played a lot of soccer at school, and I was the best soccer player at school. So that's a brag about being <laughs> good at soccer in elementary school. But like, um, I think like this story had a big part in me. Uh, again, I'm not a hockey. I didn't know much about hockey. There was no hockey culture in my house. I just decided that the Montreal Canadiens were going to be my favorite team. Okay. And that was because of this, the, partly because of the story. <laughs> yeah. Um, these are also the years of the legendary goaltender, you know, Patrick Waugh. And they won, you know, the Canadians won a Stanley Cup in 90, it was 92, 93, right? So they were like, around that age, that was like a cool team to like, because they were good. Yeah, well, actually, the first Cup Roy won was in 86. Okay. And yeah. he won it again in 93. That oh, was the okay. last Cup, Montreal Canadiens Cup. Yeah, that's the last time they won a Cup, right? But it, yeah. in Niagara, like, because we are like uh, close geographically to Toronto and culturally obviously too but like you could you didn't have to like the Leafs like it was acceptable to like the Sabres the Buffalo Sabres because they were actually yeah closer and I've only the only yeah. hockey game I've actually attended I've never attended a Maple Leafs game mm. in Toronto I've seen them a few times in Buffalo where the tickets were like mm. one third the price mm. basically. So yeah. you could always get in to see a hockey game in Buffalo. In Toronto, you can't get in because mm -hmm. it's super expensive and in really high demand. So, but the Canadians, I think a big reason I like the Canadians. And if you ask me what's my favorite team now, I'd probably still just, I'm not like, I don't follow hockey that closely, but I would probably say, oh, the Canadians mm. are cool. Um, partly because the Jersey is nice it's a cool color it's a nice color scheme <laughs> yeah again like it's probably related to this movie that i just i did really like i mm -hmm. always looked forward so to it, it they did like indoctrinate you That's they cool. they successfully <laughs> created a montreal canadians fan excellent out of like the the moldable clay that was the child of an immigrant yeah. like, uh max like do you play i mean you like hockey you mentioned do you do you have you played hockey too yes i always loved hockey uh being being a Montrealer, uh, the Habs, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, they're the biggest uh, yeah. team. They won so many cups. I was 12 when they won the last one. Yeah. And I remember dancing in the house when they, <laughs> they, they, they won. Oh, I just always like loved in the, the movie. The Habs. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, I played when I was like five or six, but I wasn't a good skater. I wasn't a good player. And not being the son of the coach, because that's how it works. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they they t they told me okay you'll be a uh, defense and I wasn't a good skater so I just waited for the puck there and when <laughs> the puck came to me I would shove it back all the way down <laughs> the ice nice <laughs> I never scored a goal I I wasn't a good player and um so th that was my hockey career maybe uh, 10 10 games <laughs> <laughs> oh really? Okay. It my was mother did. Yeah, my mother. My mother didn't like my attitude towards playing hockey because she she said I don't really remember it, but she said it made me really aggressive, mm. and I wanted to play, and I wanted oh. to be good, and I wanted to be competitive. Wow. But I wasn't able to because I didn't have the talent, and uh, you know, 
at the time of the story, hockey was for the poor people. Mm. You played with whatever you could find, like a severed hand. <laughs> <laughs> if there happened to be one frozen, close to you. Frozen horse turd. Yeah, frozen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ex exactly. But, and, uh, you know, nowadays, you need to have money to play That's hockey. Right. It's expensive. It is expensive. And, and, you know, we didn't have any of this, so yeah. that was my career. Maybe 10 games, defense, uh, uh, defense men well, waiting for the puck. it turned out you were good at something else. <laughs> I always loved sport mm -hmm. as a as a, a fan, mm -hmm. looking at sports, but also playing for fun. Oh, nice! So I can relate to to uh, I, I I mean, there's not many uh, works of fiction that that depict good sports. Mm -hmm. And well, in 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 literature, in Quebec literature, is something that we miss. Mm. Good writing on uh, about sports. Okay. Yeah. So uh I actually I don't uh, really know. I, I that's a good point. I can't think of a lot. There are quite a few like a few Canadian novels at least that involve hockey that I can think of. Like Indian Horse, isn't that? Oh yeah, like, Indian Richard Horse. Richard Wagamese. Yeah, Indian Horse by Richard Wagamese and maybe in other of his works. He describes hockey quite well. He's very mm. good at writing about phys like physical descriptions, like movement. He's mm. very good at writing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So have you read that? Yeah, but from a from a, a, an interior point mm -hmm. of view, yeah. from a player right. narrating how you play, how you feel about the sport, what's the what, what's the camaraderie with your fellow players, yeah. being a, in a competitive, uh, you know, the 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 interior point of view yeah. lacks in in uh, literature, I think, mm. yeah. for hockey, but for many other sports, mm -hmm. yeah. it's not a topic we read a lot about. Interesting. That's a good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Should we jump into the background mm -hmm. about uh, Rock Carrier? Okay, so here we go. So Rock Carrier was born in 1937 in the village of Saint Justine, Quebec. It's a population of 1,200 at the time. Mm -hmm. um, it's about 120 kilometers south of Quebec City, and it's not far from the U.S. border with Maine, but it's it's quite it's quite remote, especially in 1937. So Rock was the second of seven children. His father was a traveling salesman. He sold farm products, tools, fertilizer, lumber, stuff like that. His mother was a school teacher. Now, uh, one of Carrier's grandfathers had been a blacksmith. Another was a lumberjack and farmer. And so you can actually see Carrier's farmer grandfather in a 1972 documentary, also for the NFB. It's called The Ungrateful Land. Rock Carrier remembers Saint Justine. And it's really neat. It's from the 70s. And you see Carrier returns to the village. He interviews people there. Um, you don't actually get a lot of his family. You see his his mm -hmm. grandfather's there a little bit, but he's mostly talking to others in the village. And his thesis really is like how difficult and how isolated village life is, especially for those who have business or cultural ambitions mm -hmm. in the wider world. And so Carrier in this documentary says of St. Justine, Quote, the village is a metaphor for all of Quebec. I don't know. What do you think of that? The village is a metaphor for all of Quebec. Is, yeah. that, is that something that makes sense to you, Max? I can understand it, especially when you talk about um, how the tradition, traditional um, uh, way of living. He was a lumberjack, you said? His grandfather uh, was grandfather. a farmer and a lumberjack, yeah. Other grandfather was a yeah. blacksmith. So these these were uh, these were uh, fields of work that were declining at that moment in the seventies. Yeah. So all the traditional knowledge was dis disappearing with the, this whole generation. Yeah. So it's it's interesting to see that at that moment these people who were living in the same way since generations yeah. didn't have anything, didn't see anything in the future. So yeah. they cannot uh, uh, make their their knowledge. Uh, go down in history mm -hmm. with their sons and great sons and all because uh, you don't chop wood anymore in that region or you don't yeah. uh, make uh, make goods like you did in a, we'd say artisanat yeah. Uh, artisanal uh, yeah. A, a tradition yeah a traditional way so uh, there's an there's a difference between the traditional Quebec that we can see in uh, in the, the sweater story yeah and the more modern Quebec that appeared at the Quiet Revolution that changed deeply the society yeah. with uh, public mm. uh, public health, public uh, education, yeah. 
uh, nationalization na nationalization of electricity yeah. uh, that that brought wealth into the state to uh, invest for everyone that it's like we went from uh, tradition to postmodernity in a heartbeat mm -hmm. so the society changed a lot yeah. and uh, i think in the 70s at that moment uh, carrier was already in his 40s he was a well-established writer and he had succeeded in an intellectual and artistic field that wasn't easy to uh, get in at that moment when he was younger but still he he became an adult and succeeded when the baby boomers were adults yes at the turning of the 60s yeah. so there was a, a critical mass of people people with ideals uh, a lot of energy they were looking forward uh, they were looking for the future they were investing themselves in all society so I, I think what he says by that is that he's seeing that the traditional traditional ways of life are are disappearing yeah. and not whole Quebec is ready for that mo modernity that's hap that's appearing at that moment in the 70s. That's right. M might still be true a little bit today in some regions, but uh, you know, we went some some say that we we jumped from uh, the Middle Ages to postmodern times. Oh, that's so interesting. In one generation. Yeah, thank <laughs> yeah. you in for Quebec. that context. Yeah. Yeah, actually Car really Carrier says something similar. Mm. He he evokes he evokes he talks about a move he describes peasant life as uh, like a middle like from the middle ages mm. yeah, yeah farming life of that era but at the same time it's also uh cliche and prejudice yeah. because what, what i see in literature when i read it quebec literature and all and when i look at you know every cultural aspect i can uh, put my hands on i always find that quebec is more modern than we say it is yeah. at any time yeah. oh is that right and it's 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 a question yeah yeah and it's it's a question of censorship we don't see the the most interesting and the most modern works of art because censorship at the time put the lid on yeah. on them and we have to look back to see that we were way more modern than we always mm. thought we were right so, so um interesting so so Carrier's, his nuclear family however they were middle class in the context of the village so they you know for example they had a maid at the house oh. um uh, rock was a good student he was drawn to literature and theater at eight, the age of eight, he was writing plays, apparently, oh, wow. like writing little plays for himself. So he was an altar boy and sincerely pious. And because of his predilection for school and church, his family planned for him to become a priest. Uh, obviously, Rock enjoyed playing hockey, as we see in the hockey sweater. But Carrier said this of his hockey playing ability in a later interview, quote, I was a very bad player. In fact, I was the worst player on the team. <laughs> I was perhaps the one who tried harder than anyone else, and I kept trying, but I was the worst player. <laughs> <laughs> Sound familiar? <laughs> and so a few... <laughs> yeah, yeah it sounds like me. You quit hockey and you start writing. That's, right. That's what you do. <laughs> <laughs> you can't be good at both. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, more, more, of, more from Carrier. In those days, there weren't three hockey games every night on television. There was no television. There was almost nothing. So the hockey game on Saturday, it was something as big as the news from the war. It was bigger. So of course, we're talking about mm -hmm. 19, the 1940s during the war, Second World War. Yeah. Carrier attended primary school in the village, and then he went to a seminary nearby in St. Georges de Beauce. Rock hated the seminary. He said he found it, quote, morose and stifling. But he did enjoy literary activities there. He was the editor of the school paper. In 1954, when he was 17, Carrier was expelled from the seminary for having in his possession banned books. So these included titles by Zola, Proust, Balzac, and Elu Eluard. Bal I, you got <laughs> Balzac. <laughs> yeah, we, in, English speakers always say Balzac. 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 I never gag. thought of it that way. Yeah. Balzac. <laughs> anyway, these. He got kicked Very out. Very rebellious indeed. He got kicked out of school for reading this. Reading Proust is like not what I would normally think of as something to get kicked out of school for. I know, right? I mean, they keep life. trying to get you to read this in yeah, school. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, I suppose there were, I mean, naughty there, bits? there were naughty bits, probably descriptions of sex and other licentious activities, mm-hmm. I imagine. Yeah, well, I, I was talking about censorship just earlier, and that's that's one thing that uh, was really um, uh, controlled by the, the, the Catholic Church, yeah. reading from uh, the, the depictions of the city mm. was a problem. Oh? Because because the mo- modernity is associated with the city. That's where you have people from all around the all around the, all around the world. The more liberal thoughts, uh, ideals, politics come from the yeah. city, and so everything that was um, mm. not talking about. Because at that moment, when he was young, so it, it was in the the forties, the fifties, uh, education was still controlled by the church in yeah. Quebec. Mm-hmm. So, so reading anything about about books was controlled very strictly, and we had this index we call the list of books that were banned, oh. and that you had to yeah you had to ask to read. Oh, wow. So of course, of course, the the religious people had these books. They read these books. They knew all about it because they had to control right. the 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 different ideologies that yeah. were. Uh, you know, circulating mm-hmm. among their their um, their students, so they had the books and they could lend them if you ask them. Okay, but, you know, they would they would know who had what book. So it's kind of a mind control thing that that still happened until the Quiet Revolution. So reading the great French realists yeah. like Zola, Balzac, and Flaubert, and all these people that were in their time, uh, they were. Um, they went to court. Mm-hmm. People tried to sue them to censor mm-hmm. them in France at that yeah. moment. The the they were bringing modern ideologies in Quebec, which was not uh, appreciated by the powers that be. Yeah. But his generation, Carrier's generation, did the Révolution Tranquille, the Quiet Revolution, yeah. because they read, even if they mm-hmm. didn't have the right to do <laughs> it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so at that time, was there a lot of like enough literature? produced in Quebec that you could just not read books from France? Or was it, I mean, the, the way that in English Canada, the canon was like all books from England until very mm-hmm. recently. Um, is that similar? There's this, I was talking about the difference between the, the cliches and the prejudice and the mm-hmm. reality. When we look back at Quebec, we always always find out that it's it was more open and modern right. than we think. And all these books were in Quebec, they were circulating, they were read, but it was done in hiding. Mm. You know, you it, it was prohibited, but everybody, everybody who wanted to read could find a book. France has always been such a, a great writing literature nation. And of course, in Quebec, we've always looked back to France as a mm-hmm. model to try to emulate, and and we always wish to be recognized in France for what we are, and not, you know, being uh, just a, an an exotic old mm-hmm. colony that's writing with a word not proper French right. or uh, weird words or whatever. And uh, these books were accessible if you wanted them; you could find them, and the literary creation here might have been a little harder to to write modern work modern novels modern ideas these books were if they were not censored right away in church by the 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 clergyman who would say do not read these books you'll you'll go to hell (laughs) Uh, (laughs) they would be voluntarily criticized negatively in Mm -hmm. the press so they would not have a nice public Mm. life uh, so there's always been this battle between modernity and tradition. And at that moment, modernity was gaining ground. So it was the, the end of censorship, the official censorship mm. at that moment un- until the 60s. So you couldn't get these books in the library, in the public library? Some libraries. There was, there was one famous library in oh. Montréal that uh, was held by uh, Henri Tranquille was his name. So he was famous for bringing in all these books from around the world, contemporary literature, modern literature. And he, 
he did what he had to do. He survived the censorship. As uh, he was a center for all cultural activities uh, in Montreal, not just for writing, but also uh, the, the visual artists, the, uh, the drama writers, and all. So that was a I private mean, library. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But he was very active in all cultural activities, and you know. Quebec being uh, a, a big and complex society, you have all kinds of ideologies. You have the whole spectrum of all of all ideas in in the, in the cultural realm, in the political realm, and whatever. And was the case at that moment. So uh, there there are, there were modern artists in the in the forties. Uh, Refus global, you might look into it. That was a manifest by visual artists. Yeah. Paul Emile Bourdieu was a painter, very important painter. So uh, they published a manifest in '48, which which is called Refus yeah. Global. Global, <laughs> we refuse everything. Nationalism, the church, everything. Let's be more modern. Let's write. Uh, they were called the automatists, mm -hmm. the automatists. Yeah. Let's write, write and paint on the moment. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like uh, like. Pollock did or like uh, the surrealists did so there's always this fight between modernity and tradition yeah. in Quebec and the most often the most interesting interesting works are with this modern uh, writing about the present well Carrier moved he had he got kicked out of the seminary mm -hmm. in Quebec so he moved to seminary in New Brunswick he went to the University of St. Louis in Edmonston, New Brunswick. So this is now St. Louis uh, or St. Louis College at the University of Moncton. Okay. That's what it is now. So so Carrier found this, quote, uh, a breath of fresh air. So I'm assuming that there wasn't the same kind of censorship there. Um, in 1956, he was 19. He published his first book of poetry, Les Jeux Incompris, The Misunderstood Games. He graduated in 1957. And he moved to the University of Montreal, where he completed a master's in French literature in 1959. He wrote his thesis about the poetry of Apollinaire. So Carrier returned to New Brunswick to St. Louis University to teach for two years. He published another book of poetry. He wrote for magazines and newspapers. So he's coming, coming out as a writer. And he also uh, were, wrote for and performed sometimes on the uh, Radio Canada station in Moncton, so the French language CBC mm -hmm. there. With a scholarship from the Canada Council for the Arts, I don't believe I give scholarships of this sort anymore, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it was also a bursary from the French government. Uh, Carquet, he attended the Sorbonne oh, in he? Paris. Okay. He did, yeah. And he completed a doctoral thesis in French literature in 1961. While he was in Paris, he wrote for Chatelaine magazine, Le Devoir uh, newspaper. He returned to Quebec in 1964. He taught at the University of Montreal, teaching literature, and then at the military college in St. Jean, Quebec. That's a place where he would uh, spend much of his career teaching. Um, so he published uh, his first book of uh, fiction, a collection of fantastical tales, tales called Joli Deuil. So excuse my pronunciation. Uh, pretty morning. Morning, you know, as in... Um, like mourning someone's death? Mourning someone's death, exactly. So it's a collection of fantastical yeah. tales. It won, I guess it won the prize for the best book in Quebec in 1964. Oh. So in uh, 1968, he published perhaps his best known novel. We've mentioned it already, La Guerre. Yes, sir. It's a surrealist fable of life in a Quebec village during the Second World War. It examines the themes of rural life, religion, relation, the relationship with English Canada. And this was also later adapted to the stage. And I think he got noticed, uh, especially for this book, right? It's his most uh, well-known it? work. Yeah? Yes. Still? Yeah, it is. Still, well, he's not, uh, well, he's a known yeah. writer, but he's not as famous or as important as many others of his yeah. generation. So uh, La Guerre, yes, sir, really stands out. And of course, mm -hmm. the sweater is, you know, it's yeah. on the $5 bill, so you can, <laughs> <Pretty famous. laughs> you can get any yeah. bigger than that. That's right. <laughs> now here's, I don't know if you'd know this, if you would know this, uh, Max. In 1971, Carrier wrote the script for a movie called The Christmas Martian. <laughs> you know this? Yeah. It's uh, yeah, I, I know uh, about that. Le Marcy yeah. de Noël. Uh -huh. So this was the first children's yeah. feature film made in Quebec. 
it looks pretty cool. Like I look, <laughs> I watched a bit of it on YouTube, and it is it's pretty. It's just wild. It's like really. <laughs> You've seen it. It sounds like Max. Oh, you haven't. No, okay. I haven't. I haven't. <laughs> No. It's funny just looking at YouTube comments on things like this too, because somebody will be like, somebody who's like from England would be like, yeah, they, it's like, this was on TV. This was on like BBC uh, station in like 1977. And I oh. remember watching it. <laughs> it oh, was the, and it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff like that. <laughs> so uh, some people remember the Christmas Martian. Now, that was the beginning of uh, Cartier's writing for children, which would go on to include uh, a dozen titles. And this, in course, of course, includes a hockey sweater. But we'll put that aside for the moment while we just finish up Cartier's biography here. M many of his writings have been performed and ad like adapted to the stage. So in 1971, he became head of the, uh, the Théâtre du Nouveau Monde, the New World Theatre in Montreal, and he held the post for two years. So he's like an administrator. Like, you know, he's a guy who ends up being in charge of many of these our, uh, institutions. So he returned to teaching at the military college in St. Jean, and over the years, he uh, uh, occupied several posts, including dean and rector. He still had a, had a, a job there in 1994 when the college was closed. Uh, in 91, Cartier became an officer of the Order of Canada. That year, he also became the head of the Canada Council for the Arts. The head, the job he held powerful. for four years. A powerful mm -hmm. man. This is a man in very powerful and... Uh, in federal institutions. In 98, he stepped down from the Canada Council to run for political office. So he was a candidate for the Liberal Party of Quebec in the 1998 provincial election. Cartier lost by 309 votes. Very few votes he lost by to the Parti Québécois candidate Manon Blanchet in the Montreal riding of Crémazy. Um, so he just barely lost. Now the PQ won that election handily in seat count, although in proportion of the vote, they only won by 0.3%. So they won by like 30 or 40 seats, mm -hmm. but barely won in the popular hmm. vote. That was, I guess that was the end of his political, his overtly political ambitions. Um, from 99 to 2004, Cartier was the head of the National Library of Canada. Mm -hmm. So, okay. In 2005, he appeared on Canada Reads. The, so Volkswagen Blues was the book that uh, Rock Cartier defended in okay. 2005. Oh, the classic road novel. That's Volkswagen Blues. Yeah, oh, okay. that's a classic. It does a story of, uh, of, uh, of a guy that, that uh, travels around the United States in his uh, Volkswagen van, uh, okay. Westphalia. On the yeah, on the he's on the road and he's following the French Canadian uh, tradition in the United States because so many French, like a million French Canadians, from uh, 1840 to to the, the Great uh, Depression, like on the span of a hundred years, emigrated to the the United States. So there were many French Canadian. They called that uh, mm -hmm. little Canadas, little towns, all over the the. The right. New England, and that guy goes goes around in oh. his Westphalia looking for the re the remnants of the French Canadian traditions. All Sounds around like a the fun United book. States. Wasn't yeah. Jack Kerouac from a family yeah, of French Canadian Americans? Yeah, sure. Jack Kerouac, Kerouac's parents are from uh, Le Bas du Fleuve, so mm -hmm. they spoke French. Jack Kerouac's first books he, that he did not publish oh, were right? written in French. Oh, I didn't realize he was that francophone. Yeah. Okay. Oh wow! Oh wow! Oh yeah, he spoke French with uh, oh. his mother, and uh, that's that's probably why his writing and his English is so different. At, and it made him, mm. you know, stand out because he had a, he he thought in French, he oh. dreamed in French, and he wrote with with a new yeah, beat. Yeah, that's so interesting. <laughs> he's yeah, a, yeah, he's a beats yeah, beat. Yeah, he is certainly a beat. Yeah. Carrie is now eighty five years old. He writes, still writes, and publishes. He's written over thirty books of in many genres. He's received a half a dozen honorary doctorates. He has two elementary schools named after him. He His lines from the hockey sweater appear on the $5 bill, like we've mentioned here. This was the line uh, on the bill from, this was on, appeared on, on, the, on the bill from 2001 to 2013. Quote, the winters of my childhood were long, long seasons. We lived in three places, the school, the church, and the skating rink. 
but our real life was on the skating rink. That's the first line of the novel, of the book. Of the story. In 2009, 2009 Canadian mm-hmm. astronaut Robert Thirsk brought a copy of the hockey sweater to the International <laughs> Space Station for all the aliens to read in the future. <laughs> <laughs> it was yeah. for the Christmas Martian to read. Like, like this is not. This could not be a more institutionally successful <laughs> yeah. writer or story. Carrier yeah. says of the hockey sweater, "There is almost not one day in my life that there is not something nice that happens to me because of the story." <laughs> Although he admits he would like to be noticed for his mm-hmm. other thirty books as well. <laughs> you can't. I mean, you can't really complain. Come on. <laughs> Well, so yeah, it's just just like Phil Collins, who's an amazing (laughs) drummer, but all he's remembered for is his stupid drum fill in (laughs) in the air tonight. And he says, to my demise, I I did that once in the studio. Every other time I did something else because I improvise all the time. But I'm known for that drum fill, you know, so... <laughs> that goes for Rokari and his sweater. He wrote that in 10 minutes on the, on yeah. the table yeah. kitchen. It's just a, a, a short, very short fable. I mean, it's hard. You can hardly even call it a short story. It's just like a, it is like a tale. An anecdote. It's almost. an anecdote yeah. almost, but it does have a yeah. very clear structure. And yeah. But in, uh, yeah, like you mentioned, it was written very quickly. So in 1978, Cartier was commissioned by CBC Radio, English Radio to write and perform a piece explaining, quote, what Quebec wants. So this is in <laughs> so the... CBC's like, what do you want what anyway? Going on? Just tell us. And indeed, <laughs> there's good reason for English Canadians to, to wonder, <laughs> because this is in the midst of the first Parti Québécois government elected in 1976. So René Lévesque is the premier. Mm-hmm. And this is leading up to the, the first referendum on Quebec, uh, on Quebec sovereignty in 1980. So mm-hmm. this is in the midst of that whole political tumult that he's asked to explain to the English Canada, like, what does Quebec want? What do you want? So Cartier tried to write an essay, but it wasn't very good by his own admission. But he was under pressure to deliver something. So Cartier called upon his childhood memories and very, very quickly wrote the hockey sweater. He says, uh, quote, I went back to my table and I started to think, when was it that I felt that I was little me, little rock, not my mother's son, not my father's son, not my brother's brother. When was it that I felt I was really myself, unquote. So he says he first felt himself when he was 10 years old playing hockey. He, um, now this is, it is kind of, it is like really important that this was conceived for an English audience, Mm -hmm. right? I mean... Uh, Carrier says here too, quote, I read this story in English on the national airwaves. To my great surprise, reactions were extremely positive, even though the maple leafs sort of occupied the role of the bad guys. Response was so positive, it gave me the idea to publish the story. So the story was then published in French in 1979 under the title, as we've t- mentioned before, An Abominable Maple Leaf on the Ice. It is like anti, <laughs> it's much more anti Maple Leaf, uh, that title. And, um, and in 1979, the story also appeared in English translation, we've already mentioned by Sheila Fishman. But that was when it took the name The Hockey Sweater. Okay. She, it was published under The Hockey Sweater. By uh, in this English translation in 79. In 1980, the story was adapted into the animated short film, The Sweater, and it was illustrated, as I mentioned before, by Sheldon Cohen. Now, just so we don't leave Sheldon Cohen out of this, because obviously the animation, the illustrations are just really wonderful. Yeah. And so... Yeah, and I think he's he's one of the biggest reasons why this story is so popular. So just a little bit about Sheldon Cohen. So he's a Montreal artist, animator, filmmaker. Now, Cohen did not speak French. And he could not even he could not skate. Mm-hmm. So preparing to produce the film, Cohen visited Saint Justine with Carrier, and he took photos and he made sketches. And um, just another little tidbit here: in 1991, Cohen and Carrier teamed up again to make a sequel to the hockey sweater. Oh. It was called The Boxing Champion. And this is an illustrated children's story about summertime oh. pursuits in Saint Justine. <laughs> so when the ice melts, you lay. He, <laughs> Young Rock laces on the boxing okay, gloves. Okay, okay. Yeah, and he gets and how knocked did that out. Go? He gets knocked out in his first fight. But I mean, how did the buck go? <laughs> uh, I don't. I think it. Uh, I think it went okay. I don't know, but they, it didn't. End, I, I'm surprised they didn't make another NFB short yeah. about it, but they didn't. Okay. Yeah. Naomi, you want to take over the second half here? So you mm-hmm. want to like lead us through the kind of the events of the film? 
So as we talked about already, in the, the book and the movie start a bit differently in the sense that the book starts with that line that's on the $5 bill, mm-hmm. um, where he talks about how in his village, as a child, they lived in three places, the school, the church, and the skating rink, but their real life was on the skating rink. Right. Um, and we already talked about the difference in, in the film, how they talk about that they have two required locations, the school and the church, but they also play hockey. And he talks about how real battles, I mean, I'm almost reading this up word for word because it's like the, summarizing it would take as long as reading it. <laughs> it to is you. a summary already. But, uh, in a way. <laughs> but, <Yeah>. um, <laughs> well, yeah. um, he talks about how basically their real lives play out in the skating rink. And even when they're in uh, school and church, they're thinking about hockey, basically. Yeah, that really does resonate for me. Because yeah. I remember being a kid around that age and just like yearning to get outside to mm-hmm. whatever, play soccer usually or basketball or something. Mm-hmm. And just thinking that the rest of this was bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> you just can't wait to get outside <laughs> and play sports. And he says even when they're in church, they're praying about hockey. So like their prayers are uh, like consist of wanting to play as well as Maurice Michel. You know... <laughs> <laughs> praying for that. that's yeah. somebody who yeah okay he really was pious then too like he actually because when i had to go to church i didn't pray <laughs> i just waited for it to be over <laughs> oh yeah that's an inter- that's a like a notable difference in yeah. attitude <laughs> yeah um, and so then he talks about uh, the winter of 1946 when the action of the story takes place mm-hmm. and how he and his friends all wore the same uniform as Maurice Richard. So the uh, yeah. the red, white, and blue hockey sweater, of course. Yeah. But not only that, they all combed their hair and they glued it into place, as he puts it. A very... Brill cream? <laughs> the, <laughs> in the animation, they all go into the same little yeah, container, yeah. and they're all like grabbing the brill cream. And, put and it. putting it in, That's yeah. That's pretty cool. And they lace their skates like Maurice, and they tape their sticks like he did. They cut his picture of the newspapers, and they studied him, and they knew everything about him. This is so cute. The yeah. animated film is so cute showing them do this, because the kids are all different shapes and sizes, but yeah. they're all wearing the same jersey, and they're all doing... <laughs> And they all move. Yeah. They all move That's in right. synchronicity. When they glue their their hair and they when together, they take their yeah. sticks, they <laughs> do it at right. the same time. Yeah, and they all wear yeah, have the number nine on, on their back. Yeah, and it shows them playing in the film. They're all like, there's two teams, and it's they're all wearing the same jersey. Yeah, <laughs> on both teams. <laughs> yeah, how can you differentiate? <laughs> differentiate yeah, I know. Yeah, you just the, have to try to remember team, who's you know. on your team. I love that scene, and I love that scene when they're on the yeah. when they are they're out playing, and every time they get the puck and make a move, the animation transforms the child temporarily into Maurice Richard. It's beautiful. It is yeah. really beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He like grows and he becomes. Suddenly, the child grows two feet and uh, <laughs> can suddenly do something, you know, special yeah. on the ice, and it's really very nice. Yeah, I felt the same when I was when I was young and I was playing not real hockey on skates, but uh, uh, street hockey, uh, outside hockey with my friends and yeah. street hockey yes. in the back alleys, you know, and I was the goalie. I was the goaltender because I wasn't any good. I was good en- wasn't good enough to play. Max, I would do the same. Front. I would be the goalie <laughs> in to, street hockey. To be the goalie. Yeah. yeah. I was the goalie, but I had my, I had my equipment yeah. and I really felt like Patrick Roy. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. what happens in your mind when you're playing. You, you look up to your idols yeah. and you, you think. Max, I was pretending you're to be just Patrick like Roy as well. <laughs> so... <laughs> You did. Oh, so, nice. Uh, I wonder which one of us was the real Patrick Law. Uh. Well, I, I, uh, I can't pretend that I was invested in hockey, but I was forced to play hockey in school, and I was also either defense or goalie. <laughs> yeah. And you see this, you, you see this, uh, this hierarchy mm-hmm. in the story. Because when he arrives at the rink with his maple yeah. leaf uh, Spoiler alert. sweater, <laughs> yes, he's he's demoted. He's demoted to the yeah. second line and then to defenseman. So he's uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right, he's that's going right. down <laughs> in the the in the whilst you need good defensemen in a team to win. So not as glory, not as much the, glory I mean, to be won as a defenseman. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I just want to interject, like, you can edit this out if you want to, but the reason that I was put there is because I literally didn't understand the rules of, like, what I was supposed to do. I had trouble remembering who was on my team. I was a bad skater. 
Yeah. Just try to prevent <laughs> yeah, the pot yeah, to get yeah, in yeah. the net. That's all you have to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's Stop hard to misunderstand pot. that. You know your role. <laughs> or like send it that way. <laughs> <laughs> That's what get good defensemen do. But like my high school is right on the canal in Ottawa. So we did play on the canal. So we were on ice. So actually oh. being able to skate was also a requirement. Right. You could skate. Oh, yeah, kind of. But I did have figure skates, not hockey skates. It right, didn't right. really matter that much. But right. Because I just stood there like hoping the puck didn't come to <laughs> <horse> me. <laughs> they could have just put a box maybe like in the middle. <laughs> And I could have just like read a book on the bench. Sat there. Yeah. I would have preferred that. Anyway, <laughs> so the book now skips right to the action, but uh, the, there's more kind of in the movie where we see the family listening to the radio, listening to the hockey game, and the Canadians win, and the little boy goes completely crazy, dances around the house, and goes and jumps on his bed, mm-hmm. and shakes the ceiling, and all the stuff on the table is rattling and mm-hmm. dust is falling from the ceiling into the teapot. Yeah. It's a neat estab- <laughs> that establishing sequence. So they show they show the mm-hmm. title, the, the sweater, and then they have an establishing sequence showing different scenes from the village. Mm-hmm. So I think they visit the cafe, mm-hmm. the diner, mm-hmm. and they visit... I, I, it's somebody's house where a man and a woman are making out on a couch and, and it's, they stop. You just kind of see yeah. a shadow, a little bit of their movement behind a couch and you think, and you're like, oh, <laughs> but it is a kid's, it is a kid's film. Yeah, so they don't yeah. show anything, but he stopped. The man stops and gets up and he needs to turn up the radio because the game's <laughs> on and life's going to the gonna game. S- yeah, and, yes. the, the, and the woman is disappointed. <laughs> that sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but this they is a very coasting. male world yeah. of hockey as we're about to learn because... The, all the men in the story are very, very excited and invested. But, of course, all the hockey players, everyone playing hockey is a boy. And um, mm-hmm. the mother comes into play, and she does not understand at all. This yes. is like a parents do not understand type situation. Very much a parents don't understand. <laughs> yeah. So Little yeah. Rock, unfortunately, he's his, that fateful winter, he grows out of his sweater and it's ripped and it's too small. And the mother says, no, no, no more wearing that sweater because we're going to look poor. Yeah. People are going to think we're poor. So yeah. that does speak mm-hmm. to the sort of the class position of the mom and her, wor- you know, the family. Oh, sure. And then worrying about putting on seeming, seeming yeah. proper. Yeah. I would not have been allowed to wear that sweater either for the same reason. Yeah. So we want to get you a good sweater. And she doesn't just buy the clothes anywhere. She only buys the latest styles from the Eaton's catalog. Nothing from the general store in town. Um, I, have but a, I have a note about the Eaton's catalog from, okay. from um, Cartier himself. Uh-huh. He said, quote, quote, there was the Eaton's catalog. They were the best based on the feeling, the culture in my family. There was nothing like Eaton's. Mm-hmm. And there was a hierarchy of the catalogs that you ordered from. Now, in the story or in the film... Uh, he makes the mother said like the, or the narrator points out that the mom would not buy stuff from the local store. Yeah, because that's the stuff everyone else gets. Yeah, order from Eaton's, it's like a step above. Now, yeah. is it because it's better quality, or is it just because other people don't have it? Yeah, it's from elsewhere. That's I'm not sure exactly what what it is, but I mean, uh, Cartier says that in his house it was Eaton's number one. The second tier was Simpsons, the mm-hmm. Simpsons catalog, later Simpsons Sears, mm-hmm. and then third was uh, a French catalog, Dupuis. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Well, I did wonder, and there's an unanswered question that this story invites, which is, did the general store have Canadians? Right. Sweaters. Right. What would the difference be? I mean, maybe different difference in quality fit. Maybe. Probably would be. <laughs> maybe. They but must. She... I mean, every, every kid in this village yeah, has not... one. Yeah, they, <laughs> it seems like they're pretty easy to come by. But the mother's like, we're getting yours from the Eaton's catalog. But... Maybe they're sold out. They're maybe. Just like, there's too oh, many. no, 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 because she would never buy it there. This is what we learned. Yeah. But there is a problem with the catalog because it's in English. Yeah. And his mother doesn't speak English. So... She, when she wants something from the Eaton's catalog, she takes out her writing pad and she writes a letter in French to Monsieur Eaton. Yeah. Um, the purported <laughs> owner. And, <Yeah. laughs> um, I mean, the way family. I understood that was that Monsieur Eaton was a, an imaginary character yes. that the mother's making. Certainly her relationship <laughs> yes. to Monsieur Eaton is, yeah. like, is, re- is imaginary. <laughs> yes, yes, where he personally receives her letters mm-hmm. and fulfills her orders, which in this case, there's some kind of misunderstanding between the, some kind of uh, problem with translation, let's say, 
And um, the hockey sweater arrives in the mail. Yeah. And what is it? But do 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 the blue Toronto Maple Leafs it's hockey a, sweater. It's a terrible, terrible Maple Leafs sweater. Mm-hmm. Abominable. Abominable. So but does the mother understand? No, she doesn't. Yeah. She's like, it's a sweater. Just wear the sweater. What's the problem? What's the problem? It and she fits. says she fits. It's a nice sweater. And she says that Monsieur Iton is from Toronto and he's going to be probably he's probably a Maple Leafs fan and he's going to be offended if they ask. They say they don't want it. And right. so they can't. So so Little Rock reco- <laughs> recoils in horror. Yes, he does. He cries. And he's like, don't get away from me with that shirt. And the mm-hmm. mom is cajol- But the mom is perfectly fine. She doesn't even understand the difference between Maple Leafs and the Canadians, really. Like, why that would matter. How could she, she, could she not know living in this film? Well, it's just not, she doesn't understand how important the she difference is. She does not understand one bit. But also, <laughs> what she likes is that, oh, it's a new sweater. It fits well. Yeah. And it's funny when when Rock is like rejecting it, she says this: "If you make your mind up before trying, you will not go very far in this life." <laughs> That's right. Which is like so. Okay, <laughs> but the, okay. Then Rock says Maurice would never wear that, and Mom says you're not Maurice Richard. <gasps> then here's this really. This is very interesting. The mom says, still trying to convince him to wear this dang mm-hmm. shirt, this dang sweater. Quote, it's not what you put on your back that counts. It's what you put inside your head. Again, I think of the Fresh Prince song, the classic, Parents Just Don't Understand. Parents Don't Understand. Where the where uh, his mom says, you go to school to learn, not for a fashion show. Right. But of course, the, <laughs> the mother is being entirely hypocritical here because mm-hmm. indeed she's very much worried That's about true. what's on his back. That's the whole reason he got a new shirt is because mm-hmm. she was worried about his appearance and yeah not but she doesn't poor. understand why it matters yeah which sweater it is and she points out that you know if you don't wear the sweater you can't play hockey so like that's what's important to you right because Mi- Missy Eton is going to be so offended by the request to trade sweaters that it's going to take him like a year to do it yeah the what do you think of the mother character uh, Max this is this this is a complicated uh, character and and it's really interesting what yeah. it's, what it says about yeah the society at that moment because i mean there are only a thousand citizens yep. in that little town everybody knows yeah. who is poor yeah. and who is not poor already you don't need to have different clothes to to perform your class everybody knows everyone so she wants to buy from eaton yeah. for the appearance and it's weird that she would Right to She's Mr. She's so Eaton, naive. Uh, yeah. With such familiarity, with such familiarity as she would have with That's the right. general yeah. store manager right across the street. I mean, she would know that it's a very important person, a very important mm-hmm. uh, uh, company. And uh, there, there are differences in the French and the English versions that are really interesting because it says when they're arguing, uh, little Rock is arguing with his mother, and she says to him in French, "You know, Mr. Eaton is yeah. English, so he would be offended if we, mm-hmm. we if we rode back to to switch the jerseys." And in the English version, it says she says, "You know, Mr. Eaton yeah. understands French perfectly, but." He's English and he prefers the the maple leaves. So these differences in the story, this is the most important difference between. So she's saying the two this is no a misunderstanding. He knew what I wanted, but he didn't want me to have it. Yeah. yeah. Yes, 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 yes. So um, I mean, I don't. This is not a a, a a a nice character to me in terms of representing the typical mm-hmm. French Canadian mother. Uh, she's not very she has no uh, understanding idea. of everything <laughs> yeah. that's going on. She doesn't mm-hmm. understand his son. She has no idea, and she sounds Absolutely. just uh, stupid. Clueless. I think, yeah. <laughs> in my opinion, she, yeah. One thing I find interesting so, about her is how um, that that detail about how she imagines that shopping from Eaton's creates a personal <laughs> relationship to Monsieur Eaton, and how that is a a kind of class pretension, a desire to to like to only do business with the best and to co- only consort with like the rich and the wealthy and how that kind of betrays um, her desire to be better 
than than other people in the village, right? Yeah. But there's always room for misunderstanding because the Canadian yeah uh, Canadians is the name of the team, but it's all also That's the name of the people living in Canada, and it's also a, the, a Canadian identity. So you could be English Canadian, mm. French Canadian. So if you order a Canadian hockey sweater, That's it true, could too. be from the That's other right. Canadian yeah. team, the from from Ontario. Though, yeah. So there's place for misunderstanding. I think for her, <laughs> it's more important. Yeah. To appear well put together and wealthy than to appear like a fan of the Montreal Canadiens. For her, like that's her hierarchy of of importance. Yeah, but I things. agree with uh, Max that it's like it's a kind of stupidity that could let her think that that was more important in this context. Yeah, sure. Sure. You know? Yeah. Like it's a profound misunderstanding. It is a profound misunderstanding. Yeah. Um so in the movie she chases him down <laughs> and forces the sweater she, onto his body. She puts it on him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he's crying and he's yeah. not happy. And yeah. he's humiliated. I mean, he looks good, actually, in the sweater. <laughs> well, it's a nice color, but that's really not the point, is it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, it fits, it fits so nicely. Um, and um, so then, yeah, so we already talked about her explanation of how he has to wear it because otherwise he can't play hockey at all. Mm-hmm. For the rest of the season. So off he goes. And you can just imagine how awful he feels heading for the rink in that blue sweater. I just, uh, anyone who's ever been a child, <laughs> they're just like cringing. <laughs> yeah. So off he goes. And everyone's standing there in their red and blue sweaters mm-hmm. and the nine on the back. And he arrives and the sweater weighs on his shoulders like a mountain, he says. <laughs> The captain so comes says, yeah. and tells that tells him that he needs to wait. He'll need me later on defense. So he's not even playing at first in the book. He's just yeah. He's uh, what it's called benched. He's benched. He's benched, man. <laughs> <laughs> Rough. <laughs> and Rough. by the way, the the referee, as we learn <laughs> from the imagery, is also the priest from the church. The referee is yes. Yeah, the curate, the priest, whatever he is. He's also yeah. the the hockey. Co- or not coach, but referee. So by the third period, he still hasn't played. It's not just that he's on defense or goalie. He has not played at all. He's just sitting there. He's really upset. Finally, someone else gets hit on the nose and gets a nosebleed. <laughs> and he's like, yes, finally me. He jumps on the ice. And the referee <laughs> says no. And he says there's already five players on the ice. And that, so he got uh, he got called for a penalty. He gets called for a All penalty. All right. So is uh is this a legitimate penalty or is this persecution? Yeah, I didn't understand that either. He yells, "This is persecution!" Right, and he yells mm-hmm. and he smashes and the he stick. He smashes the stick against the ice. It breaks. Right. So yeah, is he right? Was this a legitimate penalty? Yeah, you can't have that's a, that's yeah. called a too it many is a real man, too many men so on the ice. So it's because the guy with the nosebleed hadn't actually left the ice yet. It is. <laughs> he was just bleeding on the ice. Oh, okay, okay, so he, okay, okay. Yes. Yeah. Now yeah. I guess this is a pretty serious game if you're calling penalties of that type. <laughs> or it was just an excuse to get rid of him. I think it was just an excuse yeah. to get rid of him. I think there's room for uh, interpretation here. I, mean, I assume that it was just an excuse to get him off the ice. Well, Ro- Rock reads it that way. Yeah. He understands that he's being persecuted. He yeah. thinks that this is an unfair penalty. He is penalty. being persecuted. It, technically, it's a penalty. <laughs> it is technically a penalty. Would they call it in other circumstances? I don't know. We'll don't never know. know. Certainly backyard hockey, or nobody ever would call us such a penalty. <laughs> it really is a tech, very technical penalty. All right. Well, I think we know what's really happening here. Well, we know that the, we, we yeah. know that the priest is a, a Canadian fan because at the beginning right. of the movie, he listens to the, he sure to the radio he sure broadcast too. So he knows the rules. He That's knows right. the players, mm-hmm. their names and all. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So he gets – so the priest gets mad and he's like – he says – Son, this is this is a difference too in the translation. I think in the English and the French. In the in the English book, he says, "My child, just because you're wearing a new Toronto Maple Leaf sweater doesn't give doesn't mean you're going to make the laws around here." Mm. Mm-hmm. A good boy never loses his temper. Take off your skates and go to the church and ask God to forgive you. That's right. So the uh, in the in the original French, if I understood it cor- correctly, he he says um, the the vicar says. Uh, my child, just because you have a new Maple Leafs jersey, differently than others, au contraire des autres, 
that you're yeah. that you're going yeah. to make the law for yeah. us. They cut okay. it in, in, so, in the English version. But the, I mean, he really points out that because you're different than everybody else. Oh, okay. This is one thing he does not appreciate, right? Right. Yeah, and so that's a different value than his mother expressed, because his mother's expressed the idea that. Indeed, they he should stand above the right, others. Right, should stand uh, out as being better, as having nicer clothes. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, that's exactly. Right. Yeah, as and being then, richer. Then, <laughs> but the uh, you know the clergyman express it disapproves for another reason, right? Actually, when so in that documentary for 1972, um, Carrier talking right. about his grandfather who ran an unsuccessful, an unproductive farm for for decades. And Kaye in his um, voiceover says, why did my grandfather persist in farming here all these decades, even though it never was successful? It, the, the ground like it was infertile. Mm-hmm. And he says, I think it was because of the church. Mm. The church tells you to accept your lot mm-hmm. in life, what God is giving you, mm-hmm. and even if you have to suffer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So he mm-hmm. understands. So Kaye has a kind of certainly a criticism of like... Um, how the church and its ideology will hold you down, will hold you back, uh, will be a conservative force in your life Mm -hmm. because it resists you doing anything new or different. Right, right. right, And so we see that here, yeah. Yeah, and right at the beginning, it says the first uh, few sentences of the the text uh, shows that even if we're all the same, we still can have rivalries, there's a hierarchy going on mm-hmm. That's right. Uh, right inside the community, within our, ourselves. That's what it says, the first sentences, that's what it is. Real life was on the yeah. skating rink, la vraie vie était sur la patinoire, les vrais combats se gagnaient sur la patinoire, la vraie force apparaissait sur la patinoire, les vrais chefs se manifestaient mm-hmm. sur la patinoire. So all the life struggles, uh, you would experience them on the skating w- rink without even having this external right. rivalry with another team, That's with right. another country for, for that matter, you would still have a complete society, functioning mm-hmm. society within your own community. So this is a, this is a really important um, trope in Quebec literature. Obviously he, he's writing that at the, the almost in the 80s, in, in the 70s, at the end of the 70s. But the, the end of the terroir novel. Mm-hmm. Okay. Terroir would be writing the rural novel, talking about church, family values, agriculture, uh, the French language as being the, 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 the most important uh, foundations yeah. of the society. Uh, the last important rural novel it's called the Survena, somebody who's appearing in the mm. the village. He's from somewhere else, and he disrupts the the uh, mm. the community because he's from somewhere else. So that that exotic detail coming in and disrupting yes. uh, the uh, equilibrium is always something that it's it's a recurring theme. Right? Yeah, it happens in here with the, Quebec with literature. The... The shirt. So that's interesting. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. The shirt that arrives from outside. Exactly. Mm, yeah, exactly. That's so true. Exactly. That's so true. It's really interesting. And it's, you know, yeah. it's mm. clearly a political fable. Uh, very interesting in uh, many regards, especially when the mother says, you know, you have to respect that's that's right. the, the power of Mr. Eaton. It's easy. You have to respect that he... If you want to be a good boy, <laughs> that's a nice lesson from the story. If you want to be a good Can- French Canadian boy, yeah. you have to respect the powers, the power of the English uh, people who you know have the control of what we can wear yeah. in life, of what all the goods we can have to uh, get you know uh, grow in the society, yeah. move up classes. You have to respect them. That's a nice. That's why I think it, uh, when Carrier presented that story first, it was well, well received in English Canada, but he, because it shows a, a side of Quebec hmm. that I guess the English Canada might like. We're kind of a little bit, yes, and you know, we're weirdly religious. Yeah. We don't accept oh. uh, the others. It's all cliches yeah. that are summed up in that little story, and that's why it fits so well the the narrative like, about French Canada. Mm-hmm. So I'm not surprised mm-hmm. at all. It's on the $5 bills. 
It's really it's 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 a vision of Quebec that fits yeah. well what Canada wants to know right. about. I mean, it's Quebec, a nostalgic how it's represented vis- revisitation, right, of a of a pre quiet revolution Quebec. Yeah, it's no, rec- there's two yeah. pages left. Oh yeah, go story, ahead, please. So maybe continue. I'll just tell you how it ends. Yeah, we'll just finish the story. And so then I'll just read more. you the rest. So wearing my maple leaf yeah. sweater, I went to the church where I prayed right. to God. I asked God to send me right away a hundred million moths that would eat up my Toronto maple leaf sweater. <laughs> the end. Right. Mm-hmm. And in the animated film, <laughs> there's a wonderful kind of, uh, what would you call it, a thought bubble? Where Maurice Richard appears, and yeah. he reaches out and he doesn't he shake yes. little, little Rock's hand? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he shakes his hand. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. So actually, he was praying yeah. to Richard. He wasn't praying <laughs> God. Then, he was praying to Richard. <laughs> we get to see and the cloud another, of moths. They did. They did. An, imagination. There is an yeah, animated yeah, yeah. moth surviving. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, well, so many little mm-hmm. details that were added in the movie that are not in the book. That, that's really interesting. Yeah. The movie is so much richer and it shows little scenes, interesting scenes, like when uh, the little boy steals right. a cookie in the jar right. when his mother is, you know, she's talking about something else and he steals a, steals a cookie. Right. The couple kissing at the beginning when they're listening to the hockey game. That's a really nice uh, added yes. detail. And the priest listening to the hockey game too, which shows. I mean, it's a it's a rural little community in the forties, but yeah. you can see mo- modernity appearing there too. The radio, the fact yes. that the priest ah. is the the referee. Yeah, uh, that's that's an important uh, detail because at that moment, uh, uh, it was religious teaching. The schools were led by by. Um, by religious people and they would teach everything yeah sports they would skate with the 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 younger ones they would they would go hiking and hunting and everything uh, they they thought uh, uh they taught uh, science they thought everything that would make these young boys in the 40s become the leaders of the quiet revolution one generation later so so the priests yes. of course were a, a conservative force keeping all in place and preventing, yeah. uh, you know, liberal ideas and uh, modern ideas. But many priests mm. uh, quit the church at the Quiet Revolution. And all, the, all these young people, uh, Rocquier yeah. is in, in himself, went to the seminary. So, yeah, so people like, yeah, like people like Carrier a generation earlier would have gone into the church in some capacity because he was an administrator and an educator and to, to access yeah. those roles you needed to be in the church right sure and and most of them would reject the church mm-hmm. once they became adults and the society changed so much and to see uh, that priest of course he wants to teach a lesson you have to accept defeat yeah. you don't you know keep your tempers down and everything but still he's yeah. promoting mm-hmm. sports and elk health and and every so these priests uh were good teachers and helped the younger generation to become uh adults that Mm. would right participate in the quiet revolution so that's that's an interesting generation at that exact moment in the 40s to be a kid in the 40s you would grow into modernity and priests would participate in that the, the the transformation of the society so that's an interesting character the mm-hmm. priest because you know yeah. he, you know he loves hockey he, he listens to the radio and he's the referee but that's still right. he has to perform his duty and punish that young man but which is interesting because when the church in quebec disappeared as a as a very uh powerful institution Quebec has been since searching for another transcendence, <laughs> and hockey has fulfilled some kind yeah. of this this uh, f- uh, this function because the the Canadians were so powerful. The team they won so many championships, and French Canadian players were so good. So you could put your hope into their victory. You could hope for. Uh, Canadians victory and sometimes we refer to the Canadians as mm, yeah. a religion that's what fanatism is just like some right. some football teams in Europe or in South America uh, you know there's the, the community you know 
feel yeah. like they're represented in their in their team and the hope and i mean that and that's not that's a good reason why Maurice mm. Richard appears in church yeah. mm -hmm. when Carrier is praying that's right he's like a religious figure and we have that well less less today because the team is not as important anymore and doesn't really represent right. French Canada as it you as, as it used to so we don't feel that religious appeal with the Canadians today but it has it has been some kind of a religion I mean rock was like in that final scene what he's I mean what has he learned he's learned that he's learned he's been ostracized I mean maybe just temporarily in the story but he's been ostracized from his community and that is building is supposed to build character strength in him that he can take that he can take that punishment and deal with it and he's also He also wants to get rid of the Maple Leafs jersey. <laughs> he still does, despite his mother's insistence. He would just like this Maple yeah. Leaf jersey well, to his disappear. His mother's just wrong. We all know that. Well, I, I feel like in a way the mother signaled in 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 like in, insisting on Rock being an individual, appearing better than everyone else. There's a little hint of the value that kind of liberal value of being a strong individual who stands above the rest, that Rock actually absorbs from her. Like, I think, despite the story, uh, I think, in a way, like, you kind of see Rock having emerged from this whole thing as more of an individual, I hmm. think. Like, resisting his mother in some ways, saying, no, I don't want this jersey, but also adopting a little bit of her lesson in that you have to be better <laughs> than other people, just a little bit. And also having been kicked out from the game and every, all of his friends and, and all left behind mm -hmm. and he's been ostracized from the community. It's kind of a, a signal to the writer, the budding writer who we know already is a successful writer because he's written this story and he's now famous that you're going to have to leave the village. You're going to have to reject or grow beyond some of the values and the mm. people and the ways of life that you found here. Right. It's kind of set yeah. him up to the story sets him up to leave mm -hmm. in a way. Yeah, I was really left. I'm really left wondering at the end of that story, but I want to know what happens. Does he get to play again or what? Does he get a new Canadian sweater or does he get yeah. accepted with his <laughs> blue sweater? Or what happens? There's a famous photo. <laughs> there's a famous photograph of 10 year old Rock Cartier wearing the maple oh, sweater and he's smiling. He's got a big smile. Yeah, there is a famous photo out there mm. as proof. Oh, is you that know, right? This really, the story really happened. Oh okay. my gosh, that's so cute. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess we've already made some summary remarks yeah. on the story. Any other closing remarks, final thoughts from from you, Naomi, or you, Max? Well, just for us, you know, a very simple appreciation. I think that the the the, the way movie better. Mm. way is better way better than the story itself. Uh, the to yeah. add all the power of the imagery to this very short story adds to it a, a great deal because you know mm -hmm. showing so much text without telling adds mm -hmm. so much more to the, the the narrative intent that all the little details we notice that eating a cookie in the jar uh the family eating uh, during you know listening to the the hockey game while eating at the table all, all the little details uh it makes it way better and i think that's one of the biggest reasons why it was such a success because of the right. quality of the the drawings and the movie because it's a little insi yeah. insignificant this little short story but what it what yeah. it what it grows into with the, yeah, the drawings it makes revisiting. it way better and, and and it adds it adds signification because yes. that that appearance yeah. at the end right. Maurice Richard appearing in the church Yeah. It has it adds a lot of signification, and you can find so much more information with the movie than just with the text. So it, um, you know, sometimes we say that uh, 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 cinematographic ad adaptations of of novels are not good. They yeah. they don't they don't give more. They give less. But in th that that particular instance, it's the contrary. Oh, and, and the, the music, too. So we, didn't, we didn't talk about the music in the movie. Yeah. But oh, we did it. Yeah. So at the end, when he's praying and Maurice Richard appears, the, the, the song that's playing is the song of the Canadian Montreal that we hear oh, is it? On, oh. In, on the organ in the Montreal on the Forum. the organ. Oh, and, that's so good. And the arrangement turns it into 
uh, religious uh, ending with uh, oh, a, a, wow. a, a, missed- yeah, a suspended fourth that resolves into the first, uh, the first chord. So they turn the Canadian oh. song into a religious yeah. anthem. So that's significance that's so for you. Mm, yeah. So yeah. Good. yeah. Oh, that's terrific. Yeah. yeah. Oh, thanks for catching that detail. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I totally missed that. Um, I was wondering, I mean, so this this story emerges, it's, it's, it's like Carrier writes it in the context of like uh, Quebec, you know, growing Quebec sovereignty movement. And he wrote it in direct response to, to that. I mean, he was asked to, yeah. right, by the CBC. What... Like, how do you read the politics of this story in the, I guess, in the frame of federalism or sovereignty or, I mean, I'm assuming that Carrier was very much a federalist considering he made his his life and yeah. career in federal sure, institutions. Sure, sure was, of course. Yeah. Well, it's... I, mean, uh, this is a, I read this as a defense of federalism and it must be in a way. I yeah, mean, of course. Yeah. Uh, well, you have to accept that uh, Eaton's in a power, position of power and he, he yeah. gives us modernity, he sends us what to wear and and and, and yeah. gives us a better life. So you have to respect that. And yeah. uh, it it's not a problem to have uh, different ideas and 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 different uh, people and and symbolism coming into our community that will be okay. I mean, it's hard not to read it as a, a political stance, saying, "All right, we, uh, we're Canadians uh, in blue or red, and that's what happens, and we have to accept it and and work around it." And it also pinpoints some some kind of uh, uh, paints a negative a negative portrait of Quebec French Canadian rural life yeah uh, the, the you know the 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 priest will punish you uh, mm. uh, don't try to be different so there's some kind of uh, self criticism from Carrier yeah. about French Canada so yeah. it's definitely a political piece of work piece of art of course um but there's so many different you know comparing the two versions also highlights mm-hmm. important differences because and they were all accepted by Carrier because he was the narrator of the French movie and the English movie so yeah, he's okay with right. every difference between the different uh versions mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. uh to add in the English version that Mr. Eaton speaks very good French hmm. why would yeah. you add that so the so the English uh, the English uh, readers would think that Quebecers believe that Eaton speaks French because obvious obviously he does not. <laughs> the French Canadians <laughs> in the upper society would speak English to Mr. Eaton. He wouldn't speak French at all. So right. what is the purpose right. of this transformation? What is the yeah. purpose of removing the abominable in the titles? Yes. Yeah. Why is it toned down in the English version? Yes. That, these are good political questions. They I don't are. have the answer, but obviously it was made friendlier to the English reader mm-hmm. and to, to the, yes. the English viewer. All these little differences are really interesting. And also yeah. in, the, in the drawings, there are... Misspellings or mistakes? Misspellings or? in the French oh. words in the, in the drawings. You said that oh. uh, that the 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 the, um, the artist didn't speak French. Well, it shows no. because when there are oh. French words in the book, there are misspellings, oh, mistakes, no. like in the illustrations. In, in the illustration, even in the letter that the the mother writes, and she's a teacher, and she <laughs> she makes a spelling mistake in French. Cher Monsieur Eaton, there's a there's a, uh, a, a misspelling error in her own writing as a teacher. Okay. So all these differences <laughs> also highlight yeah. how we work as translators between the two cultures, and how mm-hmm. yeah. you know this was not uh, uh, proofread. Is that how you say it? Yeah. <laughs> so Max, at this point, at this point of the uh, episode, I'd like to ask our our guests, what projects they're working on uh, currently or in the future? Yeah, well, I'm working on my, my postdoc project, uh, 
was a research creation project, but actually I only did research because there's so much work to do <laughs> during these last two years. But now that I know what I have before me, I'm going to start writing next year about, oh, nice. uh, yeah, about a fur trader, fur trader who was oh, okay. injured by a shotgun uh, to oh. the stomach. Actual, actual uh, true story in the 19th century. And his injury uh, healed into a fistula, we called a, 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 a hole that gave yeah. access to his stomach by, by the outside. Oh. And, uh, and the physician who saved his life was a military surgeon at the trading post in the Great Lakes, saw the opportunity to study the stomach, how the, how the digestion, digestion works. So from oh eighteen for in the in the eighteen twenties he studied him from for ten years roughly and proved uh, the chemical process of digestion on his guinea pig who was a fur wow. trader from Berthierville a French Canadian like <laughs> the the majority of the the voyageurs. Oh yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So I've I'm, heard of this. I'd heard of this story before. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Uh, it's um, like uh, in all these uh, ephemeride. Uh, little weird stories we hear about but you know the this physician he's an american hero he has university named universities named after him and right. prices and gastroenterology and everything but yeah. his guinea pig is not known he's a french canadian mm -hmm. and wow. i'm going to write his life story uh biographical, okay. biographical novel so i worked on the research historical research the last two years and now I'm starting writing. So I'm, I'm hoping for time and money and, and mental space <laughs> to mm -hmm. dive into that because it's, it's really a wonderful project. It, it, it shows the whole 19th century. It's, it's fascinating. I, I, you know, I can't wait for that. And okay. also the translation of my latest novel will come out next year. Oh, so oh, well, great. Yeah. So pretty interesting things coming up. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, Maxime, thank you so much for uh, for talking with us today. It's well, wonderful to have your perspective on Thank you, on guys. This. Thanks for the invitation. It was fun. It was great. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone out there, for watching and listening. And uh, we'll see you next time.